Well, again, good morning or good evening. <laughs> Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me in your Bibles tonight to the book of the prophet Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. The theme of the book of Zechariah is the Lord remembers. And again, this book was written as an encouragement to God's people. They had been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. They returned from that captivity. They were facing all sorts of obstacles, all sorts of difficulties. They had enemies. They had discouragement. Uh, they had famine. They had drought. All these things were piling up upon them. And so God sent the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi to encourage and strengthen their faith. Uh, they needed to look beyond their day-to-day -day struggles and see what great things God was going to do for them and through them in the future. And we likewise need to do that sometimes too, don't we? Look beyond today. Look beyond the trial. Look beyond the trouble to what great things God has in store for us. The key verse is Zechariah 1.17. Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. So God promises that again, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to spread these cities out. Uh, again, this is going to be a prosperous land. Uh, again, I'm going to bring comfort. Again, I'm going to choose Jerusalem. In other words, I'm going to put my throne in Jerusalem. I'm going to be there. I'm going to bring my presence to bear there in Jerusalem. And so he promises them that. But not only did God remember his people when they had returned to the land after their captivity in Babylon, but what we see tonight is a continuation of what started last week in chapter 12. That is, he will remember his people in the last days as well. The last days after they return from their worldwide dispersion of 2,000 years. And he's going to deliver them and save them. Last week in chapter 12, we saw the beginnings of the battle of Armageddon. And as a result, that the last day's remnant of Jews will finally have a come-to-Jesus moment. <laughs> they will finally look upon him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. And they will repent, and they will turn to the Lord. It says in, in chapter 12, verse 10 again, that they will look on me, speaking of Jesus, whom they pierced. And then they will repent. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Grieves for one as one grieves for a firstborn. In chapter 11 it says, or in verse 11 it says, In that day there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem. And in verse 12 it says, And the land shall mourn every family by itself. So they finally, finally look to Jesus. Finally recognize that Jesus of Nazareth is their long-awaited Messiah. And they repent and turn to him. Now chapter 13 this evening begins with God cleansing his people Israel of their sins following their repentance. And, and again, this takes place at the end of the tribulation period. So let's get started. If you're not already there, turn in your Bibles. Zechariah chapter 13, starting in verse 1. In that day. A fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. Sin, by the way, speaks of, of offense. It speaks of the, the act. And then uncleanness speaks of impurity. It speaks of the thoughts. So both the acts and the thoughts are going to be cleansed, you see. There's going to be a cleansing that takes place. You know, that phrase... Uh, in that day is repeated over and over beginning in chapter 12 through chapter 14 uh, the final chapter of this book in fact it's found 16 times I think last week I said it was found 14 times and I must have counted it five or six times but then re reading the text again 
and I'd highlighted every occurrence, rereading it again, I found two more. So it's a phrase that occurs over and over again, 16 times. Chapter 14, verse 1 tells us what this time period references. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. So the phrase, in that day, refers to the day of the Lord, which is, is, by the way, not just a single day, but it's a period of time, according to 1 Peter chapter 3. A period that begins with the start of the seven-year tribulation and ends after the millennial reign of Christ on earth with the destruction of this present universe and earth and a creation of a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. But the portion of that day here in Zechariah 13 is the portion that takes place at the end of the tribulation period. It will be in that day that a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. God is going to cleanse his people Israel of their sin and of their uncleanness, of their offense and of their impurity, of their acts, the very things that they do, and their thoughts, the very things that they think. And this isn't just a little cleansing. It's not a bucket to wash in. It's not a cistern uh, to dip in. It's not a pool or a lake to bathe in. It's a never-ending fountain. It's a fountain that will continually run and continually wash and continually cleanse. And notice again, this is for Israel. It says, for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This verse is not speaking about the church. We've already been forgiven. We're already clean. We're already in Christ, in heaven, getting ready for His return, getting ready to come back with Him when He sets up His kingdom. And so this verse is for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. In verse 2 it says, "In It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. So in cleansing Israel, God will also cleanse the land of idolatry, false prophets, and demonic spirits. In that day, God will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they're not even going to be remembered anymore. No one's even going to remember what their names were. Even the memory of false religion will be removed from Israel forever when the Lord returns. They won't even remember what these things were when the true Messiah is among them. All false prophets will also be gone. It says, I will cause the prophets to depart from the land. Uh, and this is not speaking about true prophets, but false prophets. And we know this because in verse 3, it says they have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And in verse 4, that they wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive. So these are lying, deceiving prophets, not real, true prophets of God. True prophets don't lie and true prophets don't deceive. So these are lying, deceiving prophets. True prophets speak the truth of God to man. Amen? In addition, God is going to get rid of all demonic spirits. I will also cause the unclean spirit to depart from the land. Uh, we know from the book of Revelation, chapter, uh, chapters 19 and 20, that the beast, that is the Antichrist, and the false prophet will be sent directly to the lake of fire uh, when Christ returns. And that Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But we wouldn't know what happened to Satan's army of demons during the millennial reign of Christ without this verse. It says here that God's going to remove them. He's going to cause the unclean spirit to depart from the land. I suspect they join the Antichrist and false prophet in the lake of fire. In fact, we read this in Matthew 25, 40, 41. 
uh, that the everlasting fire, that's speaking of the lake of fire, the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, the devil gets a thousand year uh, reprieve in the bottomless pit, but we read in Revelation 20 verse 10 at the end of the millennium, he then gets thrown into the lake of fire as well, into the everlasting fire. But at the end of the tribulation, the unclean spirits are cast into the lake of fire. It says, I will cause the unclean spirit to depart from the land. And we know again that that this place is prepared for the devil and his angels. So we suspect that that's where they depart to. And then Satan later, uh, in chapter 20, verse 10, ends up there as well. So when Christ returns to set up his kingdom and reign on earth for a thousand years, he will cleanse the land of idolatry, false prophets, and their false religion, and demonic spirits. In verse 3 it says, It shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who begot him will say to him, You shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. In that day, speaking of the coming kingdom age, false prophets will no longer be tolerated. I hope fake news won't be tolerated either. (laughs) But false prophets won't be tolerated. Parents will take a stand against even their own children who begin to go down the path of false religion and false prophets. And, And maybe if parents were taking a stand today against many of the things plaguing our society that we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in. Amen? Uh, We're beginning to see uh, parents take a stand now against schools that have become indoctrination centers instead of learning centers. They've become indoctrination centers. They're no longer teaching our children. They're indoctrinating our children. And parents are beginning to rise up and take a stand against that. I hope It's not too little, and I hope it's not too late for our children's sake. Now look at verses 4 and 5. And it shall be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive, but he will say, I am no prophet. I am a farmer, for a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. So when society no longer accepts or tolerates false religion, every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. When the truth is known and the true Messiah is living and ruling in Jerusalem, they won't be able to pull the wool over anyone's eyes either. It says they won't wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive. You see, they won't be able to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. The fact that society will take a stand against any uh, and all false religion and false prophets will lead those who would otherwise be involved in that to then become productive members of society instead. It says, they'll say, I'm no prophet. I'm a farmer, for a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. So they'll become productive members of society instead of uh, problems for society. You know, we've been telling kids to get a job for years. Finally, they will. Look now at verse 6. And one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now you notice that none of the pronouns are capitalized in that verse in your Bible. And, and there's some disagreement on who this verse refers to. Some see it as a continuation of the previous verses regarding false prophets. Others see this verse as a reference to Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, Those who see it as a continuation of the previous verses about false prophets cite the fact that self-mutilization or mutilation, uh, wounds between your arms, uh, was a practice of the false religions. But in the coming kingdom age, they'll have to honestly confess uh, 
that they got the wounds basically fighting with their friends uh, instead of uh, in some other uh, religious right or way. Uh, it says, then he will answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So in other words, you know, these cuts aren't because I was mutilating myself for some false god. I was, I was over at Ed's house and we were fighting. <laughs> and, and that's how I got hurt. And that's how some see this particular uh, verse. Uh, but those who see it as a reference to Jesus' crucifixion cite the fact that the very next verse is quoted by Jesus in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, and he applies it to himself. Uh, certainly, Jesus was wounded. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was crucified. It also happens to him among his own people, the Jewish nation, the, the house of my friends. I sort of lean to the fact it's speaking about Jesus, um, but it's hard to decipher exactly who it's talking about there. But the next verse, without a doubt, is speaking about Christ. Look at verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. So after the Last Supper, on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus turns to his disciples and says this in Matthew 26, 31. He says, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So he quotes this verse. And, and, and here in Zechariah, this verse and the ones to follow stand in contrast to the false prophets mentioned previously. They were liars. They were deceivers. But the word of the Lord through Zechariah, you see, came to pass exactly as it was written. And in fact, Jesus himself quotes Zechariah, which is the proof that he was indeed a prophet of the Lord. Jesus, you see, was struck that very night when the soldiers of the high priest arrested him. The next day, he was scourged and crucified. When Jesus was arrested, we read this in Matthew 26, 56, but all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. And it said in Zechariah, it said, and the sheep will be scattered. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And when Jesus was arrested, his disciples were scattered. They fled, it says. So Zechariah, unlike the folks we just read about in the previous verses, was no pro a false prophet. God's word through him came to pass. Now with the death of the Messiah spoken about in verse 7 here, Zechariah then leaps over the entire church age as if it never existed because it didn't to him. His ministry was to Israel, not to the church. And so he leaps over the entire church age and speaks about the coming faith of the believing remnant of Israel in the last days. Look at verse 8. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. So in the coming tribulation period, two-thirds of the remaining Jewish nation will perish. It says here, two-thirds shall be cut off and die. But God will save a believing remnant. It says, but one-third shall be left in it. As of 2021, there were 15.2 million Jews in the world. Using this number, only 5 million Jews survive the coming tribulation and enter into the kingdom age in their natural bodies. 10 million Jewish people will die in the tribulation period. 10 million. 
Hitler killed six million Jews by comparison. Uh, and this is, by the way, why the Bible uh, calls this time in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it calls this time the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob, who is Israel, is going to have a lot of trouble during the tribulation. Ten million Jews or more, depending on how many more people are born to, to the Jewish nation before the Lord returns or, or the tribulation starts. Ten million is a huge number. A huge number. It is indeed the time of, of Jacob's trouble. But it also says, but he, Jacob, shall be saved out of it. And by the way, not from it, but out of it, which is what Zechariah also says in the very next verse. Look at verse 9. I will bring the one-third through the fire. We'll refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. So God will not deliver believing Israel from the great tribulation, but he will bring the one-third through the fire. And, and he will do this in order to bring them to faith in their Messiah. I will refine them as silver is refined uh, and test them as gold is tested. And they will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. So at long last, Israel will come to a saving faith in God and in Jesus of Nazareth as their Messiah. They will call on my name. And as we read in Joel uh, chapter 2, verse 32, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And this verse, by the way, is also repeated in Romans 10, 13. Because there is only one way of salvation for both Jew and Gentile. Amen? Amen. To call on the name of the Lord. When Israel at long last turns to the Lord and calls out to him in faith, he responds and says, I will answer them. I will say, this is my people. The believing remnant of Jews will then declare, finally, once and for all, the Lord is my God. The Lord is my God. God responds to faith. Amen? Amen. God responds to faith. And this might be the most important lesson for us uh, from this chapter. When Israel turned to God in faith, he responded to them and he saved them. When we turn to God in faith, believing in Christ as our Lord and Savior, God turns to us. He responds to us. He saves us. Amen? Amen. And, and no matter what we are facing in this life, we also need to face it in faith. You know, we walk by faith, not by sight, right? We need to face it in faith, trusting and believing in, in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He might not deliver us out of our trouble. He might bring us through the fire, through our trouble, in order to test us, in order to refine us. We read this in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, My brethren... Count it all joy when, not if, but when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So God might not just deliver us out of our trials, but he might cause us to walk through those trials. And by the way, you know the difference between a, uh, you know what a trial is, right? A trial is something that comes upon you that was no fault of your own, right? That's a trial. All the other stuff that's your fault, that's your fault. And, and that's not a trial. It's just you did what you shouldn't have done, right? But those trials are those things, you know, for instance, I'm crossing the street. 
The sign says walk. I'm in the crosswalk. Car runs the red light and I get hit. That's a trial. No fault of my own. I'm obeying the law. I'm doing what I ought to. I climb up on the building and I decide to jump off. Okay? That's not a trial. That's my fault. When I hit the ground, I get the, the, uh, the results of that, which are probably broken legs. So there's a difference. But a trial is something that's no fault of your own. But God just might allow us to go through trials in order to perfect our faith. Because when we're in that place of trial, right? When we're, we're in that place of testing, when things are difficult and things are hard, when you're flat on your back, sometimes all you can do is look up. Amen? See what I'm saying? We look to the Lord. It causes our faith to grow. We, trust, we have to trust the Lord. we got nothing else to trust. And sometimes God has to bring us to that place so that our faith will grow, so that we will totally, com completely lean upon Him and trust in Him. So God will allow us to go through trials. So may we be people of faith. In these last days, amen, as we look out upon our society today and all the things that are going on. In fact, my wife and I, we were reading an article, a news article off the internet. Oh, here's the article. I told my wife, I said, you're never going to believe this. They've changed Cracker Jacks. It's now Cracker Jill. <laughs> and she said, she said, just when you think things can't get any worse. <laughs> It's now Cracker Jill. It's no longer Cracker Jacks. <coughs> Another article we read of a, a church in uh, Chicago. During the season of Lent, they've decided they're not singing any hymns from any white guy. And we thought, what? And we do this to be unified, to have racial unity. So you, you cut one whole race out so that you can have racial unity? It doesn't make any sense. Just when you think things can't get any worse, they do. So as we look out at society around us today in our nation, in our world, we have to walk by faith. We have to cling to the Lord. We have to trust in God more than ever before. Amen? But isn't it good to know how it all ends? Isn't it good to know how it all ends? Isn't it good to know that God will make good on all his promises? Amen. And he, he makes good on all his promises to Israel. And if he's good on all his promises to Israel, he'll be good on all his promises to the church as well. We can take great comfort in seeing the promises of God fulfilled to his people Israel. And God's plan, by the way, for the church is, by the way, to deliver us out of the wrath to come. We will not be experiencing the wrath to come, according to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, and chapter 5, verse 9. We will not be going through the tribulation period. So in one sense, as bad as things are getting, we can take comfort in that. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and we'll have the worship team come back up for one final song. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, uh, for this vision, this picture of the future that you have given the prophet Zechariah. A picture uh, for the salvation of Israel. That you will cleanse them of their sin and uncleanness, Lord. You will wash them. You will bring one third of them, Lord, through the tribulation period to faith in Christ. They will at last look upon you and call upon your name and trust in you and put their faith in you. And you, Lord, will deliver them. You will provide for them. You will take care of their needs. And so, Lord, we can be certain then that you will do the same for us, that you will, you will fulfill every promise you've made to your church. And we thank you now for all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen, amen. amen.